you know, we don't normally get hardware at WWDC, which is why it's always so exciting. And usually for me, it's also exciting because it's a Mac Pro that they announced at WWDC. And if you had asked me before the event, that's where my money would have been. But instead, we got a new chip with the Apple M2, second generation of their entry model chip already. And we also got a redesigned MacBook Air and a not redesigned MacBook Pro. So I asked in a poll if you guys wanted me to talk about all of that in one video or separate it, and most of you wanted me to combine it because I guess you guys like me to do more work. So we're gonna do that today. Let's get started. So kicking it off with the M2 chip, this is actually kind of interesting. I feel like this is a very shareholder move that Apple is just kind of not ready to push out the Pro yet, but to keep shareholders happy, they kind of wanted to show that they're doing something with the second generation of their silicon already. And it's kind of cool, but I do have one complaint. Apple, your graphs suck. I just gotta say it, gotta get it off my chest. There's so little information on this graph. I could be more detailed in my breakdown of my experience with three different systems running the M1 chip than you as the people engineering this chip can be in a graph talking about how great your new chip is. What is this? Like, yeah, you finally told us what you're comparing it to, thank you, but you're not telling us how you're comparing it. What benchmark are you using other than just telling it it's, it's standard? What does that mean? Uh, anyway, rant over, let's actually talk about the chip because aside from Apple's really crappy graphs, this is actually pretty cool. So to start with, on the CPU side of things, Apple is claiming that in raw CPU performance, this is about 18% faster than the M1 platform. And they also mentioned that this is on their second generation of the five nanometer process. Now, what this tells me is that they are actually improving the CPU core instead of boosting frequency. And another way that I kind of figured this is that the M1 and the M2, at least based on Apple's really terrible graphs, are drawing the same amount of power. That means that they didn't just boost the clock speed like Intel did for five generations, but they actually improved the single core performance. In case you've forgotten, Apple's M1 chips all run on the same single core. That means that if you ran Cinebench's single core performance off of the M1 basic model, and you ran it on the M1 Ultra, you would get very similar or the same single core scores. But if you ran multi-core, that's where the big difference comes in. But if you actually take the time to improve the single core performance, that means that across the board, you're going to see better improvements. I actually did a video recently showing off how on day-to-day -day tasks, my Mac Studio feels exactly the same as my base model Mac Mini. And the only time I see a difference is on high performance tasks. You can check that video out right over there. It's kind of my long-term review of the Mac Studio. So seeing this is really cool because you see a better overall performing system with the same thermal envelope and the same power draw. That means that if you drop an M2 chip into a platform like, oh, the unredesigned MacBook Pro like they did, you're most likely gonna get the exact same battery life because it's drawing the same amount of power, but you're getting better performance across the board. You're also getting better graphics performance on this system, though this is kind of a cheat because they just threw two extra graphics cores in there and said, hey, 35% improvement, which makes sense because you have more graphics cores, but I can't knock it because they did say that Resident Evil The Village is going to be able to run on the M2 based MacBook Air and presumably by extension the MacBook Pro. So cool, I guess. No, I'm kind of bashing it. It is cool to see better graphics performance because even day to day tasks can always be improved with better graphics. And actually, while we're talking about graphics, feeding these graphics cores and actually the CPU cores as well is now up to 24 gigabytes of RAM at 100 gigabytes per second. As a refresher, the M1 maxed out at 16 gigabytes of RAM at 50 gigabytes per second. And this, along with a few other things, really became apparent when I was doing video editing work because while unified memory, even on the M1, is awesome to see and gives you incredible performance for the kind of memory you're using and the amount of memory you're using, it's still data and it still has to run at some speeds that maybe, for the video tasks I was doing, <laughs> can't be done. So having that improvement and just having more RAM to play with is awesome. Now there were two other things that stood out to me about this chip and that is the media engine and the ProRes encode and decoder. When I was using the M1 Mac mini as my main video editing machine, the performance was awesome. And for the video editor who wants a cheap, fairly capable machine, this is still a fantastic little box. But having video encoders, both in the media engine and ProRes encode and decoders, that is a game changer. So for the video editor on the go who wants something lightweight with a ton of battery life that can crank out ProRes footage, this is really huge for anybody in that very specific camp. 
And then I guess for anybody who actually films ProRes on their iPhone, I've done it a few times, but moving it is a nightmare. But if you are in that camp and you do want to try to edit it on one of these new MacBooks, yeah, it's easier now, I guess. Overall, aside from the really terrible graphs that Apple showed right at the start, the actual improvements to this chip are huge, and I can't understate that enough. It's really cool to see that Apple's already really pushing the second generation of this chip by adding things that were generally better quality of life features. However, I have some different thoughts on what they ended up putting this chip in. So now we're gonna move over to the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro. Specifically, let's start with the MacBook Air. So let's get the good stuff out of the way first. I love the colors, I really do. As pretentious as the names are, I love the colors. I love the design. I think the design looks fantastic with one exception. And I love the fact that they brought MagSafe to it. All these things together are awesome. It's just great to see sort of a return to form, but also a total redesign. And speaking of return to form, one of the forms that didn't return was the iconic wedge shape that we have always had since the start of the MacBook Air. And I feel like they did this because by having the laptop so thin, the wedge is sort of just unnecessary. Like the original reason why the wedge was there was to make the laptop seem thinner than it really was. And to be honest, as thin as the original MacBook Air was for its day, Compared to some of the stuff that's out now, it's kind of a chonk. Still thin, but a thin chonk. Either way, because the M2 chip doesn't need a fan, and because the battery life is so good, Apple can now just make these machines stupid thin. They don't need to wedge them anymore, and that's actually really cool. Actually, it's funny because at under half an inch thin, this thing feels like what Apple was trying to do with the MacBook. Not the really cool MacBooks that I've done a bunch of videos on, which you can check one of them out right over there, but the really crappy one that came out in 2015 that was underpowered and really didn't do anything well. Yeah, that one. That's what this feels like they were trying to do and now they can actually do. Actually, now that I think about it, Intel's chip that didn't require a fan was called the Intel Core M and it was terrible. And Apple now has their M processors and they're fantastic. Oh, how the times have changed. So yeah, it's thinner. I don't think it's any lighter, actually. It looks fantastic, and as pretentious as the names are, I love the look of every single one of the colors on this machine. However, I don't like two aspects of this machine, which are the screen, specifically one part of the screen, and the price. So let's start with the screen first. The Liquid Retina display that they put on this machine, which is brighter and admittedly looks pretty nice, has a notch just like the MacBook Pro. And I've seen arguments on the web saying that like, oh, well, there are gaming laptops out there with like these bump outs at the top of the screen where they put the webcam and Apple would never do that. And I agree, Apple would never put a bump at the top of the screen, but I would rather them make the lid of the laptop a touch thicker and just put the iPad Pro's camera in there. That thing is fantastic. You get the ultra wide view. You can not only get ultra wide, but you get face ID. If you're gonna put a notch, put face ID in it. Like, come on guys, please. And also these tiny ass little cameras on the iPad and the iPhone can do 4K video. And yet here we are with a $1,200 laptop that doesn't have face ID, is honestly a beautiful machine with a notch at the top for a 1080p webcam. And that's it. I didn't like it when they did it on the MacBook Pro and I tried out a MacBook Pro. And yes, when you go full screen on these apps, it does go away. But one of the benefits to the MacBook Pro was the mini LED display. And it doesn't look like the MacBook Air has a mini LED display, which means that in dark rooms, you're still gonna have some light on those black bars at the top. And yes, I know that the actual toolbar at the top is thicker for that notch, but unlike the iPhone, which I immediately forgot had a notch when I started using it, I couldn't ignore it on the MacBook Pro. I don't know, it's just because it's a different shape and it's a little more prominent and also because I don't use apps in full screen, I use them on a desktop layout, I just could never not notice it. It was really irritating and now the MacBook Air is gonna have it and it just bums me out. And yes, I did say $1,200. This machine starts at $1,199 and for me, that's a bit steep for a MacBook Air and considering that the MacBook Pro is really not far off in terms of price from the MacBook Pro and you get the same chip, it just makes it a much harder decision. In fact, I would lean to the MacBook Air if I was looking at a MacBook Pro, but on the same hand, if I'm looking just for a MacBook Air, I would be more inclined to buy the one that's already out that is still only $1,000 because that $200 price bump for a chip that gives you 18% more performance and a full redesign 
might be compelling to some, but I feel like is not gonna be worth it for others. Honestly, the pricing just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me for what you get because you get a binned M2, so you only get eight graphics cores, and you only get eight gigabytes of memory and 256 gigabytes of storage. If you want the full 10 core graphics and you want a respectable amount of storage, you're spending $1,500, and that still only gets you eight gigabytes of RAM. If I were to spec out a MacBook Air for myself, I'd probably get 16 gigs of RAM, 512 gigs of storage, and without question, I would get the full M2 chip, and that would bring me to a cool 1699. And if you max it out, you're looking at a cool $2,500. That is $500 more than the Mac Studio that I bought, and the Mac Studio would whoop this thing's ass in performance, and the only thing I can't do is take it with me. Cool. Actually, now that I, hold on, let me, I just thought of something. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So, originally, before I waited for the Mac Studio, I was actually considering getting a MacBook Pro, the 14-inch model, and I was gonna bump up the M1 Pro chip, and I was gonna give it 32 gigs of RAM and keep 512 gigs of storage. If I had bought that model, I would have spent 100 more dollars on it with a better screen, better performing chip, more RAM, and the same storage, but faster, than I would have if I waited for a MacBook Air. The spec'd up version of the M1 Pro with 32 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage is $2599, as opposed to the MacBook Air with two terabytes of storage, 24 gigs of RAM, and the maxed out chip at a cool $2499. I think I know what I would get if I was really looking for a laptop. I mean, I guess if you just want a MacBook Air for regular college use, it's pricey, but you could get by with the eight gigabytes of RAM. I've already shown that day-to-day -day tasks are still great with eight gigs of RAM. 256 gigs of storage, you better buy yourself an external drive. That's all I'm saying. And I guess if you're not really worried about graphics, eight cores is fine, but like pricing wise, it just doesn't make any sense for me at least. And don't even get me started on the MacBook Pro. They didn't redesign it at all. They kept the touch bar. It's the only Mac that still has a touch bar for the two people who enjoy it. And all they did was just slap the M2 chip in it. Like, I know there was more engineering put into it than that, but overall, it makes no sense. I don't mind the design, but it's definitely aged and sort of out of place compared to most of the new stuff that has come out recently. And the design language is just sort of a callback to a not as kind time. <laughs> I still have not forgotten those godforsaken butterfly keys. Either way, I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. I guess if you want to take full advantage of the M2 right now and you don't want it to throttle because there's no fan, you could do the MacBook Pro, but it's going to look so dated. It's already starting to look dated, surrounded by all these newly designed machines, so I guess time will tell how it actually ages. And then, of course, like I said, I don't get the pricing on the MacBook Air. And for those of you who are just looking for a cheap Apple laptop, buy an M1 iPad Air. No, actually, they still sell the M1 MacBook Air, so if you really do need macOS and you want something that is capable of running macOS, has Apple Silicon, has great battery life, they're still selling that MacBook Air for $1,000, which I honestly feel like is what the new MacBook Air should have started as, and they should have just given the boot to the old design, but I'm not a bean counter, so maybe there's some other reason to keep it around. Whatever. But you know, like I said at the start of this video, it's always fun to see new hardware at WWDC just because it doesn't happen that often. And even though it wasn't a Mac Pro running Apple Silicon like I was hoping, it was still pretty cool. We got to see a MacBook Air that was completely redesigned, something that we haven't seen in a very long time. And of course, we got the new M2 chip, which was honestly the most exciting thing for me. Either way, that's been it. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget to subscribe because I've got all the betas, iPhone, iPad, Mac mini, all of it. I'm going to be testing it throughout the week and making videos. Also, comment. Let me know what you guys think about this video. I did actually really enjoy the hardware that came out, and hopefully, as much as I complained about some of the stuff, you guys got that. And like, maybe dislike, doesn't matter. If you do dislike, I won't see it, so leave a comment letting me know why you disliked it so I can improve for later. And aside from that, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Make sure to be there, and have a good one.